Make way for the Microsoft. This is Control Structure, episode 137 for November 21st, 2017. Big, huge week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit nexus.tv slash cs137 to see them. I am your host, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is the other host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. I think we should, like, start to mix this up or something. I'm not sure. How, how would we mix it up? Hmm. Well, aside from you doing the intro sometimes, maybe you should do something other than say hi. We could say hello? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Greetings? We should, maybe we should think more like Chris and completely ignore... Uh, the idea of greetings all lies. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah, it's been like six years since this network started. Oh, that has been a while. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the first show hasn't really done anything in like years. Which is unfortunate, but uh, aside from the Fringe, which I don't think really is like a canonical show, like we're probably the longest running show on the network. Do you think we're gonna cake or something? Um, no, I think we might get shot because we might be kind of boring to some people. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's been like a month since we last did an episode. Yes, I've been off busy working on my house and discovering wonderful things that don't work. You have a house? I thought you had a shack. Oh yes, the shack. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One that's falling over. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned, like, it would just be better to replace the entire house instead of repairing the foundation that's, or something? That's what the contractor is telling me. His other idea was, he's like, just build another foundation over there and drag the pieces of the house you want over onto the new foundation. <laughs> Which... Which, from what you're saying, isn't really much. Like, the wiring is all messed up. There's hardly any insulation. When it snows, it rains inside. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently the former owner had a reputation in the local community. He, he was known for being able to get the job done any way possible, <laughs> regardless for safety. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile... Last week was the first week in about a month where I was not going anywhere. Uh, I was, you know, like no one was flying into the office, or and I wasn't, uh, and I was not giving a tour to anyone. You know, it was just a normal week where I could just like sort of relax and just do some work and like not have to worry about anything after work or anything. So and uh, oh, I used uh, the tea uh, four days last week to go to work and stuff, so so yeah, that means I uh, walked almost an hour uh, for like four days last week. Walking is good exercise, especially when when uh, when you spend all day typing. Yes, and uh, then yeah, I hit the bike downstairs for like an hour, both Saturday and Sunday, so yeah, you know, the, uh, the one downstairs in front of the andrewbailey.com <laughs> with the <laughs> CRT on top. So, and now for this episode's LOL IOT. <laughs> so, uh, an Internet of Things vendor has gone out of business, and they're going to brick all of their light sockets. And they aren't saying sorry. They're like, we have about three months in our, uh, our, uh, ser service provider they'll probably keep it up for. Barring any major bugs, you probably have your lights for three more months. Yeah. Then we're turning the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> or, like leaving them stuck on or what have you or, or whatever they happen to be doing last time they phoned home to the mothership so when you know when the server behind your uh, little iPhone light goes out um, light isn't going to do anything and your iPhone probably isn't going to do anything either oh. or or to be specific your iPhone app is not going to be doing anything uh, the 
the answer to that actually, and I, I just remembered, I actually did have a raspberry one. Uh, they recently on the raspberries project they had announced uh, Gladys project, which is basically a home assistant for all of your smart devices that it controls. So now your server can be in your home, controlled by your Raspberry Pi, not out in the cloud where people shut it down. So That's we, the answer to this. So we do have a Raspberry. We do have a Raspberry. I just forgot about it. <laughs> that that was well, the only problem. Well, no, ultimately you remembered it. I did ultimately remember it. I'll, I'll send it to you so you put it in the shutouts. There you go. We had a Raspberry. We just didn't get to scream. <laughs> we don't need to scream, like, all the time. Just yeah. some of the time. Remember, just mix it up sometimes. Okay, we'll mix it up. Okay. So, uh, meanwhile, uh, Firefox. Uh, we've we've been talking about Firefox for uh, quite a while. And uh, it released uh, version 57 Quantum with like their Quantum stuff in it. So, uh, the Quantum is just sort of like a code name for like the engine underneath. But it's still called Firefox. Because, like, I remember reading an article, I think it was on PC Gamer, that essentially says, like, oh, yeah, Firefox is now quantum, blah, blah, blah. I was like, wait, slow down, like, get your stuff right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the completely new browsing engine, uh, which does not really support the old style extensions. Uh, so it's, like, completely multi-process and multi-threaded and everything. So if you have, say, a 16-thread CPU, it's really going to be fast. So it was neat, you were talking about how they, to do that with the Firefox, they used uh, Rust is, they rewrote a lot of it, so that was what was allowing them, versus in the C++ having all kinds of issues with shared memory access and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah, Rust, I'm not sure, is, is at least five years old, I'd, I think, that, uh, you know, it... it is pretty strict on like memory safety and like general safe things and for things that might not be exactly safe it has to be declared as unsafe so you know that that kind of like sounds weird but i think that is like okay this this does not exactly you know conform to like these rules or something but, uh, you know, again, it kind of helps when you're multi-threading a, uh, a lot of things. So, uh, like, they pretty much started this for their, uh, like, their mobile browser, mobile operating system. And they've been kind of, like, pulling parts of that into Firefox. And uh, it's obviously helped a lot. So, like, uh, you, the, in this uh, kind of handy blog post with the... Uh, uh, sort of XKCD style comics that uh, it pretty much breaks down into uh, like how their CSS uh, engine works now, which apparently gives like a lot of the gain apart from all the multi-threading stuff that's going on. I've noticed that they're really good at giving good graphical uh, representations of what's going on and explaining the topics. Yeah. They do a really good job of that. So, uh, it also explains that uh, Web Render, which is their uh, GPU based rendering, uh, is going to be coming uh, soon next year. So, uh, you know, if you have like a fat gaming GPU, uh, it's going to get a little bit of a boost further. They did a good job with kind of redoing the UI too and making it fit in with the, the more snappier feel, because oftentimes. You get a, a new UI and you expect it to act different, and it does act different. It, it was kind of a, a when I first saw, it, I was like, "Oh, they changed the UI." I bet it's still slow as always, and I, I did notice it was faster. I was like, "Oh, that's kind of neat." Uh, yeah. So they did a good job of coordinating the two things together at the same time. Uh, but hopefully, you did not try Firefox. Uh, let's see, I forget which which exact day it was. Um, that. Uh, Apparently, level three had an outage. Uh, I think it was like maybe Friday, two or three weeks ago, that um, everything on Comcast crashed. Like you know, the uh, office where I'm at uh, has Comcast Business, and like shortly after lunch that day, like nothing would work. So no internet. Yeah, and for someone who works in the cloud all day, that's a problem. So, so you're telling me you weren't able to access your, your Stack Overflow and get answers to your questions? Uh, 
I was not able to connect to like whatever sandbox I'm using. Uh-huh. Not able, to, <laughs> not even able to communicate with a mothership back in Kansas City. I would, I would just try to call call on a reference to the the Indian article we read once about the guy that couldn't operate because he couldn't access Stack Overflow. <laughs> so you know. At least uh, the uh, platform I'm working on, you know, there's not really a Stack Overflow for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, if if your uh, like development environment is like sitting on a server, who knows where? You know, internet is kind of necessary for that. So Comcast was pretty much all down. Then uh, it's like, okay, work from home for the rest of today. And uh, you know, I get here. You know, thankfully. Uh, Verizon, uh, was still up, but, uh, then I sort of poked around a little bit and found that Verizon was having problems in some areas as well. Mm. Uh, but I remained up for the rest of the day. Uh, apparently what happened is that level three, uh, like one of those big backbone companies that apparently got bought out by CenturyLink, uh, pretty recently. Uh, so... Uh, like when people realize that this was a level three problem, they're like, oh no, like their new owners probably messed something up. Uh, but apparently it was just a misconfiguration. Uh, let's see, a route leak to be specific. So this route leak got out and, uh, pretty much, uh, messed up a lot of people. <laughs> so, uh, apparently that got fixed within like, uh, two hours or something. So... I mean, at at first it seemed like the like it was like the end of the internet, and, and... <laughs> it's all gone black. We will return to the caves. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the this does bring up the point though of how easy it is a simple little bitty mistake can bring the internet to its knees, and that's kind of a bit what the article talks about at the end. And uh, I mean, with countries such as North Korea hating us and the rest of the world and having their own private internet inside of their lines that they really obviously don't care about the rest of the internet uh, that puts other countries in a really nice position to try to bring us down because uh, that, that would mess up a lot of stuff to not have the internet. I mean, my phone it works off the internet. Without the internet my phone doesn't work anymore. So, um, lots of things like that. Have you noticed the usage patterns of a lot of people on their phones? <laughs> It pretty much everyone's phone is the internet. Yes, but it's yeah. Without the without the internet, it's it ties a but lot of communication. Down. Espe- especially the Twitter and Facebook addicts. Yes, this is true. Especially like like if you if you, you know, if the internet doesn't work, they don't have access to their drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm getting the the, the shakes here, and I, I think I'm stuttering. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's like I, I I need to know what's going on. I'm missing out. Oh! <laughs> what if someone else also has the internet gone too? I need to know so I can console them and give them a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Wow. So, um, meanwhile, uh, so a Microsoft employee uh, was doing a presentation about Azure. Uh, this was like way before that level three problem. Uh, was giving a presentation on Azure uh, when uh, Edge kept crashing. Uh, you know, the new Microsoft sanctioned browser. The new Edgy browser. Yeah. Uh, uh, formerly known as Internet Explorer. But, uh, so the edge on his laptop kept crashing. So during the presentation, like right in the middle of it, he installs Chrome (laughs) and pretty much carries on. And, uh, the reaction from the audience was, uh, pretty good Mm -hmm. about that, I'd say. He has good humor that he mixed into, like, when it pops up, he's like, would you like to send data to, uh, Google to help it make it better? He's like, let's not make Google better. (laughs) He unchecks the box. (laughs) Yeah. Good on him. So, uh, you know, like, all these driverless cars that, uh, like, everyone's saying that's going to, you know, buy... I don't know, like in 20 years or something, like they're going to be everywhere and everyone will use them and stuff. Uh, So apparently there was uh, like sort of like a trial or like a limited uh, shuttle service in Las Vegas uh, that had just opened and within an hour crashes. Oops. Um, 
how should I say this? Except the shuttle itself did not crash. Uh, a semi backed into it. Oh, okay. So it wasn't the shuttle's fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, it it apparently was like stopped somewhere, and this uh, semi starts to back up. Uh, and apparently the car noticed it was backing up, but like apparently that was not a situation that was uh, you know foreseen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's responsible for its actions, not the other guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know. This kind of you know leads to some questions about uh, what exactly should a autonomous car do when like moving is a good option. You know, maybe uh, you know it, it it might move, but then that you know should it move, but then it also needs to look to see where it is moving to mm-hmm. if that is safe to do. Um, and also that it doesn't run people over. Or, so I, I feel like just driving away maybe isn't fully the best option. Yeah, in all a, circumstances. A good, a good thing you could do for sure that it's not going to hurt anything is if it truly thinks it's going to get hit is it could just blow the horn. Yeah. That's something it could do that, I mean, it's going to be super annoying for the guy inside if it's a false thing, but that's not going to kill anyone. It's yeah. blowing a horn. So that's something simple you can do. Yeah. So I wonder, did have they done much testing with the shuttle before they let it out in the streets without a driver? Because I, I I know with like Uber, they they had a driver ride with it most of the time. And I I would as I heard I would think so, you know. Otherwise, it wouldn't even have made it that far. I would imagine. Uh, so uh, there's been uh, big news between AMD and Intel, and probably not in the way that you'd think. So. Uh, you know how Intel's GPUs kind of suck? So apparently they've kind of noticed that and decided to uh, partner up with AMD to put uh, like a small Radeon GPU right beside like a, a mobile Intel CPU uh, and also throw in some uh, some of their fancy HBM2 memory. So this is going to speed up uh, the integrated graphics a, hmm. a, a lot. So they're basically throwing in the towel on the, their integrated graphics and saying AMD can do that better? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so they go on about, you know, how how much uh, better it's going to be and also uh, how, how should I say this, like their sil- the silicon interposer layer on, like, Vega GPUs, how that's uh, not exactly a good idea for a few reasons. And how they need to, you know, create this other kind of uh, interconnect uh, that's, you know, how should I say, s- solves a few problems. Uh, for instance, like getting the top of the die, like where the heat sink goes, get that all flat. So it's, so it has uh, like very good uh, uh, touch with the heat sink. So that's an interesting move because that could position the future for the monopoly them to be less competitors and more so getting into a monopoly in certain areas of the market. So, um, one of the guys behind that GPU, uh, Raja Koduri, uh, left AMD, uh, like about a month ago. And, uh, you know, like there was a letter going around, uh, apparently he was on like some sort of sabbatical for like three months, but about two months in, you know, he's like, yeah, I've kind of noticed something. Like, I don't want to work here anymore. <laughs> well, maybe maybe not quite like that, but essentially, he left. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I guess good luck with that. Uh, because the day after, he shows up at Intel. <laughs> so, so, wait. So, you designed a GPU at AMD... Left and then now you're going to Intel. So maybe Intel's hoping he'll design it one for them. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what they're hoping for. Um, so now, like Intel is saying, you know, like maybe in a few years we'll be making our own discrete GPUs that don't suck. So the question is from a copyright infringement and things like that. So AMD should obviously own. Uh, like the GPUs they have? Yeah, the ones they have. So this guy can't just cu- pull up his design of the old one. He would have to design something new. Right. Or take whatever 
he can from the dumpster fire of GPU technology that they already have mm. and, you know, do something with that. That's true. Take an upgrade and see where the problems are because he's obviously very good at what he does and maybe he can improve on flaws. Yeah, so Intel has been touting like their graphical capabilities for some time, but it never really measures up to much. So I'm not sure if it's because of political reasons or because they think that, you know, the GPU market is already crowded, which is pretty strange because Intel is the number one GPU vendor, uh, like for PCs. And Mm -hmm. I was going to say like in the world, but I'm pretty sure Qualcomm maybe, or like whatever GPU is in by default in cell phones. (laughs) <laughs> would probably, probably yeah probably that might be the number one so like easily intel has like 60 maybe 70 percent of pc gpu shipments just because like they've put their gpus on pretty much every intel cpu in the past five years at least well no longer seven years at least because uh my sandy bridge has an intel gpu in it Mm. and like that's been around for like six seven years now so yeah so um i forget do you uh work with python any professionally no but it does open my garage door that's right it does open your garage door my garage door so uh are you keenly aware of the python 2 versus python 3 thing uh not keenly aware i've had dependency problems like oh you should use two and then two doesn't work and you have the trouble installing and things like that oh you Uh, should use three (laughs) not incredibly strongly so do do tell so numpy uh which is a very popular extension uh used for like scientific stuff Mm. um is dropping python to support uh, as of 2019, all new feature releases will be on Python 3, and after uh, July 1st, 2020, uh, they'll be uh, not supporting it anymore, even with the security re- uh, fixes and bug fixes and stuff. So, yeah, this is uh, going to force quite a few people, maybe, uh, over to Python 3. So... Python 3 has been around for 10 years, and, you know, I've been using it pretty much ever since. Uh, But, like, for, like, a lot of, like, heavy uses, it was not quite ready. But from what I've gathered, it seems to have solved quite a bit of its problems. So what was the biggest deal with that... uh... They did a major redesign of it, and then it just had instability for a long time? Uh, Well, it was more like feature parity, from what I can understand. Uh, Also, it uh, kind of changed the syntax just a little bit. Uh, For instance, uh, some uh, keywords like print became functions. I see. So, uh, and also Unicode support. Like, everything is Unicode in Python 3, but not... Uh, guaranteed uh, to, or at least like native strings are not Python. Uh, native strings are not Unicode in Python too. Mm. They they exist, but they are not Unicode by default. Okay, that's that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, let's see, and like a few other things, but off the top of my head, those are like the two big ones. So uh, yeah. Uh, they all, uh, NumPy or whoever is behind this uh, says that you know if you want to support uh, support NumPy on Python two after that you're free to do so, uh, but it's not going to be from us. So yeah, have fun with that. Uh, some things that you might have fun with are supercomputers, and Linux seems to be a very popular. Uh, option for supercomputer operating systems. In fact, it's so popular that every single one of them is using Linux right now, at least according to the top 500 list. So that, that puts it at the, the, the best 500 supercomputers, which that's, that's a good indication it's, when you it's, get into your best. These are the best supercomputers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, apparently there were... Uh, two uh, AIX-based systems that have now fallen off the list. So now every single uh, 
at least the 500 fastest supercomputers are all running Linux. So, you know, pretty much every supercomputer down to, uh, like, most servers, down to most cell phones, run Linux. Someday the desktops will uh, will interchange and and laptops everywhere will have Linux on them, too. Uh, maybe. Uh, desktops, eh, uh... But laptops, I'm pretty sure a good minority of them will still be running Mac. Those Mac people always had to hold under the Mac. <laughs> yeah, like they're they're I, okay. I, I was talking with the work th- with the guy, or I was talking at work today with a guy, and I was like, well, at least Macs have the magnet thing going for him. That's one thing. And he's like, no, they actually dropped the magnet power plug. He's yeah, like, they dropped that now. I'm like, yeah. oh, absolutely no reason to ever get a Mac now. Totally yeah. done. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you know, like, I've I've never owned a Mac, uh, but, like, again, like those uh, laptop cords, mm-hmm. that was a really genius idea. It was! Yeah. They got rid of that? Like, yes. I couldn't believe that when I heard that. that. That, to me, was, like, the best Mac feature I have ever seen. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess this kind of goes towards the argument that Mac doesn't really care about uh, utility uh, as much as, like, you know, form and design. Because, like, the latest MacBooks, they're all USB-C ports. And, like, there are certain rules over, like, what you can plug into, like, each port. They're all visually identical. Oh, but each one's different. In slightly... Uh, minute ways, yes. That's kind of messed up. Yeah, that completely goes against, like, the Mac philosophy. Yeah, this is make it easy. I just can't stuff it in any place. I have to go look up the instruction manual and be like, oh, this one you're not supposed to plug your phone into because it fries it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you know, let's see. That I want to say that that feature was introduced, like, ten years ago or something. So the, the magnet one? Yeah, the magnet power cord. So in another 10 years or so, like all those patents should expire. Okay, this is perfect. I don't and need to buy and, Mac. and uh, maybe by 2027, uh, all your laptops will uh, have magnetic power connectors, maybe. That something Unless you you're running a Mac, in which case they will not have magnetic not power adapters. Yes, why, why are they go back? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm. But even then, like even though you have this, you know, fancy dancy magnetic power connector, uh, like every model had a different power brick and like connector into it. So yeah. Hey, speaking about laptops and Linux, which is probably where you were trying to steer me towards. You just didn't go there. I, <laughs> I tried as hard as I could. Um. So some of these uh, laptops do run Linux already, uh, including yours. Uh, but apparently Linux, or Linux, Dell has uh, kind of dove into this a little bit. And, uh, you know, like we've talked about this before and how they've released uh, some laptops that run Linux right out of the box. And uh, Tech Radar has a interview on two of the guys uh, behind this about how, uh, like, before it was, like, kind of half-hearted attempts at, like, uh, releasing discount machines. Because even at that price point, uh, like, Windows costs money. So if you can cut out, uh, like, even 50 or even 20 bucks or so, like, because those large OEM companies, like, have volume discounts, Mm -hmm. like, even $20 off of a, like, a... $500 $500 laptop, you know, you can, you know, improve that quite a bit. Uh, but uh, they've decided to, you know, target maybe a more of a higher end market, uh, like with the XPS machine, uh, you know, not not the highest end machine, but, you know, still rather mm-hmm. up there. Uh, and it's apparently been mildly successful for them. They were saying how the initiative that got started, I believe they they were given a budget of like forty thousand dollars or something. Yeah, it was just a really small amount of money. And but six just, and yeah. six months to prove mm-hmm. that they could not only build a compelling Linux laptop offering, but Dell could turn it into a viable product and make money off of it. It's interesting because it seemed like they said as people in the company 
heard about the project that different ones chipped in and wanted to be involved and were interested in it so they had a lot so, of traction uh so uh, apparently they jumped on a plane and went out to silicon valley to visit some very large web shops uh which apparently they did not name any specifics uh but uh, apparently they could only show them prototypes of a laptop that may sort of perhaps might be coming to market uh but apparently the reception, of course, was get back to us when you have something real, but we are interested. I think the telling figure is where they talk about the uh, reorders, and, or not reorders, the pre-orders and the number of people that I uh, had been willing to pre-order in their beta program. I'm trying to find the number here. Um, it was quite a large amount, something like, like 9,000 or something perhaps. So uh, they recalled how a typical week uh, his blog would average 1,500 hits a day. When the XPS development station was mentioned, views skyrocketed to a peak over several weeks of 9,000 a day. So yeah, apparently that was uh, quite a hit. So yeah. So if you would like to uh, submit some feedback on the show, please do so on the Nexus.tv. And don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your stuff. Uh, so, including your cloud drives. Including your cloud drives. And uh, maybe even your uh, cloud uh, light socket server things, <laughs> if you can. So uh, speaking of, so you know that uh, little bash on Windows Linux thing? Yes. Um, so apparently I've been able to uh, coax rsync into syncing uh, my Windows machine up here to my server in my basement. There you go. Over SSH. So it would be secure. So just in case there's a man in the middle listening yeah. inside your network, it will be okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mainly did that, you know, if I'm, say, somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, also, I set it up on my work laptop, so now I can synchronize any music I might have downloaded uh, here uh, to work. There you go. Nice. So, yeah, it works both ways, and uh, I've been able to uh, coax the SSH on the uh, inside, like, the little Linux thing uh, to talk to uh, KeyPa- KeyPass, which has my SSH key. So, like, uh, like instead of using a password, mm-hmm. you use public key crypto to log in. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, your key pass opens with your uh, SSH key then, or your RSA key? Uh, pretty much. Nice. Something like that, yeah. So, as long as you keep your password secure on your computer. Yeah. And don't leave it unlocked <laughs> when you go away from your desk. Yeah. In fact, uh, some of my coworkers have noticed that, you know, I hit Windows key L to stand up. <laughs> Like, even if I, like, go take a leak or something, I do mm-hmm. that. Uh, well, where I work, it has the the privacy issues because we have healthcare data in and around the company. And so, like, you have to lock it. So if someone forgets, like, inevitably someone sends an email out on your computer volunteering to buy the entire company food. Yeah. So most people are very careful about locking <laughs> their computer. <laughs> it's a good, a good encouragement to lock. Yeah. Um, let's see. Then, uh... So, yeah, like, even even where I'm at, you know, occasionally we might be logged into production, and, like, you know, it might be a little difficult, but in theory you might be able to access someone's credit card numbers, but, uh, uh, like, I'm not exactly sure what the people out in Kansas City think, but, you know, I generally lock my Mm -hmm. machine. It's just a good policy. Yeah, like, ever since, uh, uh, like, I went out to, uh, uh, Newmont, you know, like to go to college, you know, we did that lest we find, I don't know, like porn as our desktop background or something. Someone playing a joke on you, yeah. So, um, let's see, then, ah, yeah, oh yeah, and then I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but like, you know, like the power settings on your laptop mm-hmm. of, uh, like turning your monitor off after like so many minutes or so. Yes. Like, I have that set for, like, maybe a good 20 or 30 minutes, but when I lock my computer, my external, like, all, my, both my laptop monitor and my external monitor, like, shut off after, like, two minutes, maybe, 
like maybe one minute. It must be some other setting then that it's finding. Yeah, it's like some some different setting for huh. the lock screen. Interesting. So yeah, drives me nuts. So uh, yeah, Thanksgiving is coming up. So uh, yeah, I'm thankful for my job. <laughs> It's a good one to be thankful for. And my neighborhood, you know, and the place I live in, obviously. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Are you thankful for your shack? I, I am thankful for my shack and okay. the place where my shack sits, too. That's that's <laughs> probably that's more thing. important. <laughs> more so. That was, that was kind of the idea of the place. I understood when I, I purchased the shack that it was quite possible that there may have been issues with it. And I, I knew that going into it, so... I mean, not ideal, but that that was not a sur- total surprise that it w- worked out that way. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I, I get to go go deer hunting maybe on it some in the upcoming weeks, and the turkey season opens back up, I believe, on Thanksgiving Day and goes into Friday. So maybe I can go shoot a turkey like I'm thinking early morning, <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, shoot the turkey, pluck it and boil it and cook it. Maybe I don't know. We we'll see. That that might that might be a little too short turnaround. Might still be like wiggling a little bit when it comes in the plate. <laughs> or or no, like uh, maybe a, a little bloody at least. <laughs> so I like our turkeys fresh. <laughs> yeah. So um yeah, sounds good. So have a good one. You too. <laughs>